Good afternoon. I'm Brent Glass. I'm the co-founder and senior advisor of the uh, National History Academy. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the, today's program. The National History Academy um, started in 2017. Um, and, we, and in 2018 and 2019, we um, held residential uh, programs for high school students who are uh, interested in and, and uh, committed to learning more about American history. In 2020 and 2021, we, we, we became a virtual program, but the core principle of the National History Academy, or at least one of those core principles, is uh, the power of place and the importance of historic places around this country in communicating and helping us understand uh, the importance of American history and the importance that uh, historic places play in understanding American history. And um, we're delighted with the today's program uh, that you're going to be fascinated with in Arizona at the Mission San Javier del Bac. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce Katie Smolar, who is the Director of Educational Programs for the National History Academy. Enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Brent. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is part of our Wednesday virtual tour series or every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be virtually visiting a different site in American history. And today we are fortunate enough to be joined by Miles Green, who is the executive director at Patronato San Javier. Miles, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. I'm actually joined too by two of our conservators here at the mission who've been working to uh, protect and preserve this historic site, which is in truth a working parish. And so it's one of the few missions in the United States still serving the original people for whom it was built. So could I introduce Matilda Rubio Hello. and Tim Lewis? Hi. And Tim is actually a member of a community whose roots go way back before the mission. Uh, the area that we occupy here in Southern Arizona has been home to indigenous people for at least 4,000 years. And the uh, community that was established here in Wauk on the Santa Cruz River, which just across to our left to the east, um, was the home since the 13th century of the Akamal Odom, a subcultural group of the Tohono O'odham people. And Tim is actually a member of that community. And Tim, why don't you share your story? How did you get to? Well, it's it's a long story, but I, I started working on art conservation here at Santa Mir uh, in 1992 when the first pro project started. Uh, we worked three months out of each year until 1997, and then uh, in 95, 1994, I went to Europe to learn more about art conservation, and that's where I met my wife here, Matilda Rubio, and then we've been working here ever since since. Uh, almost 1996, 1997, uh, off and on. But now we're working here permanently for the last five or six years. And Matilda actually did her training in Seville, Spain. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I went to make the university in Sevilla. And uh, my idea was to be a painter, not a conservator at all. In fact, when I began the university, I didn't know what the conservator was. Then I, I began the conservation training, and here I am. I didn't paint since then. And so, the mission uh, owes its founding to Eusebio Kino, who was a Jesuit priest. He was uh, sent, sent to this area of the country, uh, what was then considered the northernmost edge of Christendom. And he established a series of missions and the way that the airplane is probably louder than I am. Um, he established a series of missions beginning uh, at the top end of the Sea of Cortez, uh, and they stretched up through to San Javier, which you see behind me. This was the most north of the missions that he established. And the members of the WAC community, as we understand it, actually invited him here. They had heard about the work that he was doing with communities to the south, uh, along with his spreading the gospel, he had also introduced to various communities that he impacted uh, the idea of uh, different kinds of animal husbandry. So he was introducing cattle and horses and different uh, 
products that he felt could be useful to the native people. Amongst them was a, a product called winter wheat, which could sustain the harsh winters that happened briefly in this area of the country. And so the community was anxious to find out more. And so they invited him here in the fall of 1692. And as part of that visit, there was an agreement that he baptized a number of the people and also uh, establish Mission San Javier. But the building that you see behind me owes its roots to a later era of missionary work. And the Jesuits were actually expelled from this area of the country, in fact, throughout New, New Spain by King Philip of Spain. He was upset that perhaps the Jesuits weren't doing a very good job of creating good citizens of uh, New Spain, sending taxes back to the king. And so he uh, wrote an edict that saw the Jesuits expelled almost overnight from all areas of Mexico, New Spain. I keep saying Mexico, because of course that's what we know it is today. And then the Franciscan order came in, and it was the Franciscans that had the vision of building these grand structures like the one you see behind me. And so the roots of the building you see behind me uh, start with the establishment of the foundations in 1783 and extend through 1797, when, if you can see behind the uh, scaffold, uh, the East Tower, which is currently under conservation work as we speak, the top tower was never finished. The lantern wasn't ever added. In fact, there was not even um, plasters added to the top two tiers. And so the mission was left at that point because um, the priests who had started the campaign simply ran out of money. And so the mission was left unfinished, as, as often happens when money runs out, people walked off the job. And so what you see is the beautiful but unfinished mission somehow here. And the same is true of the artwork, Tim and Mathilde's work on the campaigns throughout the year, conserving the beautiful artwork that you'll see in a moment. And in several areas of the church, the art is also left incomplete. So do you think we should move in to get a better sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go. Maybe as we move in, I will continue to keep talking. Just follow me. Panorama of the plaza. So I'm just going to keep talking as we move in. conservation campaign both inside and out since 1990. Um, the first major project that was planned was actually the cleaning of the interior art. But in fact, sections of the interior plasters began delaminating and falling to the ground. So it was decided that the work on the interior should be wait until such time as the domes could be worked on. And so the first major project was replastering all of the exterior domes. And now we've been involved in basically three decades. And what you see is the last major campaign on the outside of the church, the conservation of the East Tower. And we are also beginning a campaign to do a research study on the iconic facade. that has been subject to a restoration in the 1950s, but we're about to do a major uh, reconstruction of that section as well. So let's go on in. to see the mortuary chapel. This is also an original section of the mission that dates to the 1790s. It's the area where the bodies would be brought prior to the funeral mass. And they would be left in this section of the mortuary chapel and then be brought in through the rest areas of the, into the main nave for the funeral. I'm going to draw your attention to the main doors here too. These are original to the mission. So 225 years of 
wood that's been subjected to some of the harshest climate in the world, temperatures that go into the 117, 118 during summers. And then during the winter months, it's not unusual to get days of freezing temperatures. So this is some powerfully strong wood.
Belfry. through this period that we've been inside the church because you can see there's people that worship for prayer even on a Wednesday at the body of the mission which is still partially closed because of COVID. What you saw as we moved into the nave of the mission, the high altar at the front of the church which was built to depict a vision of heaven for uh, the native people who the church was built for. This building was a teaching instrument. So of course, much of the artwork and descriptions of the biblical scenes were really to provide illustration for the, uh, for the worshipers who were oftentimes learning the gospel for the first time. One of the things we might believe that uh, Catholicism resonated from the native people in this area is the creation story somewhat followed their own creation story. So um, here we're sharing Christ. We're really sharing a story not dissimilar to the one that the native people had learned. Um, so the vision of, of uh, heaven being captured in the high altar. Um, you might have noticed two scenes from the um, Bible. The Last Supper is one of the portraits of the nave of the church. And on the other side, the Pentecost. And then within the body of the church, in each of the transepts where the um, conservators are currently working on the opposite side, there are many issues of Mary and the infant Christ and the child involved in everyday scenes of life, which is somewhat unusual for um, the Catholic Church at this time because. Usually these are grandiose visions that one sees, but here very much uh, from everyday life. Up here in the belfry, you would have seen that we came up through um, tight little passages which constitute the constitute the pathway up into the high reaches of the church, which technically is Tucson's first high-rise building. Um, in every other section of the mission, that section that we came through would have been um, filled with basalt, rock, and rubble, and limecrete to strengthen the building. But the gap between the two adobe walls, which follows very much the Roman architecture, and then is transformed through the periods um, used in many, many countries throughout the world, double layers of adobe brick with uh, a section of rubble pulled between. So this is an incredibly strong building. We went into the choir loft as well, and you will see there several areas of the choir loft that were uh, unfinished. But now we're up into uh, the belfry where you're looking at two bells, one of which was recently subjected to its first ever conservation, the one on my left. And the one on the right, which is awaiting conservation, which is to take place later this year. Um, we are fortunate in, within our board to have a world renowned conservator who's been really helpful in developing protocols for these often neglected pieces of the mission architecture. And so um, we're going to now go to the very highest section of the church, uh, the area just below the lantern, and the area that you see being worked on across the way. We're passing by the East Tower. Earlier, it's under conservation treatment, the first time uh, since the plasters were applied by Bishop Ranjon. It's involved quite a lot of structural um, repair because a lot of the adobe brick, which we know were fired in kilns on the site, it's not sun dried, it's actually fired adobe. And many of those bricks um, weren't subject to the best quality control. I kind of often talk about it as the sort of Cinderella, uh, the Goldilocks approach. You know, they made outdoor kilns, bricks were laid in forms, uh, fires were run underneath the kilns. Edges tended to be underneath. 
just right. Quality control, they just added the bricks where they got and ripped them through. The mission is actually located in the center of the Sanavia district of the Tahona Odom Nation. Uh, the Tahona Odom Nation is the second large, largest reservation in the country. It covers approximately the same area as the state of Connecticut, but it's non-contiguous, which means there are actually five separate parts to the, to the uh, nation. The biggest part lies across the Mexican-US border uh, and by far the largest section, with the center of the Tohono O'odham Nation being the town of Sells. And then here in uh, the San Javier district, we have uh, the community centered in the district office over here at Wauk, um, a modern building, and we're surrounded by cooperative farms, growing primarily uh, organic alfalfa, uh, much in demand, farmers for cattle feed, horse feed. And I say cooperative farms because all of these sections are owned by individual families uh, in what are called abates. And so the community has banded together, created a cooperative farm, blending many, many different sections of their land in order to have these large um, arable fields. And since they've gained access to water rights, this is very much burdened. Over to the uh, east here, you can see parts of the community of Rock. Uh, it is uh, a mission school right next door to us. Beyond that is the district office, a uh, very modern complex. Uh, the elders seem to be on that, and then various sections of the community. Usually on a day like today, those old structures at the base here would be filled with vendors selling the most wonderful fry bread. But with COVID, all of that has come to a grinding halt. The, the plaza that you see in front of the mission was originally part of the mission complex. There would have been uh, buildings going out in the wings uh, both sides of the plaza with dwellings and all sorts of things that are now just archaeological sites. And the plaza is still an active area where at various points during the year there are festivals, um, oftentimes there are Indian craft sales here, so it's very much a, a community centre. Well, I think we're probably ready to take student questions. Oh, did we point out that the city of Tucson is really just over to our left, to the north? Um, you can actually see the downtown just beyond the domes and beyond that the Catalina Mountains, which really defines uh, the city of Tucson. And at one point, there was actually a small visita or a, a sort of a satellite mission that was attached to San Javier, uh, located just north of the town of Tucson. Uh, but that's long gone. So, questions? Yes, Miles, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful to see. We've got some questions coming in and actually uh, one of our former students at National History Academy, uh, Ben Kellerhals, who is a current student at the University of Arizona is going to be moderating the questions for us. So thank you, Ben. Hey, yes. I'm in Tucson yeah. right now, yeah. <laughs> I was beginning to fear your questions when I heard your resume. <laughs> no, yeah, it's nothing. Um, yeah, all right. So let's start looking at this. We got some great questions, some good interactions. Um, first one, for a structure built in the 1700s, it seems remarkably well preserved. What effort goes into the preservation? Well, you see the results of about $14 million of expenditure across the last uh, three decades. 
So a lot of time and money has been spent bringing the mission back to, to the uh, state that you see it in now. Um, the section that I'm currently standing in, the West Tower, was uh, subjected to a five-year conservation renovation plan back in 2003 through 2009. Um, it had experienced considerable damage. The section that I'm standing in now was struck by lightning uh, in, I believe, the 30s, which took out a great section of the walls and the lantern above. And so that was rebuilt uh, as part of a a fairly quick repair. And so when we came in to do a much more extensive conservation project, these sections were actually rebuilt um, to make them a structure safe, uh, particularly given that this is a public accessible building. And so we're really driven by keeping every part of what we do um, safe for the public. Right. Um, next question, what were the relations between the Native Americans and the Spanish at the time of the building of the mission? Well, our understanding is all based on uh, research that changes across time, but Father Kino seemed to have developed a legacy of um, mutual respect between the Oden people and uh, particularly the priests that, uh, that accompanied him. Um, you know, he was very opposed to the enslavement of Native people in communities to the south, where oftentimes the Spanish were keen to take those people into the mines and to become really indentured labor. So we think that that tradition probably continued through to the period when this mission was built. And I think I said it, it was established, the mission was established 1692 but the building that we're in was built almost a hundred years later. So one would imagine that there were two to three generations who'd been uh, living and working alongside the mission and converted to Catholicism. So we believe that uh, the Franciscans were able to work with the native people who provided most of the labor to build what, the structure that you see. And that was um, that the labor was provided in return for either cash or uh, access to crops and food. So we think it was a reciprocal exchange. Interesting. And so a follow up on that, we've noticed a lot in some of our other sites we've been um, visiting virtually, that there's an interesting degree of relation ongoing between these all these different communities that are interacting. What What is that like today? I know living in Tucson that we try and be aware of the indigenous American population and influence in that relationship, but what is that like at a site like yours? Well, the, as I said at the outset, this is an active parish still serving probably about 40% of the parish comprises people from the village of Wok or who uh, perhaps grew up here and have moved to other areas within the city, but still see this as their um, spiritual center. So the relationships are strong. And it, actually, there's also a, a strong connection between people who have grown up in the shadow of any of the Kino missions. So there's actually a well-established um, pilgrimage uh, routing between many of the uh, Southern missions in San Javier, which was kind of seen as a crown jewel of the missions. And there's also movement oftentimes for specific feast days down into Mexico. So I think the answer to your question is that there's still a very strong spiritual connection. And as you saw, you know, Tim Lewis, who we introduced earlier as a parishioner, he and his wife have worshipped here, and he's attended the church since he was a child. And now his niece, Susie Marano, is working with us as Patronato's intern, learning skills of cons uh, conservation alongside her uncle and aunt. So those kinds of connections go in all sorts of different directions. Wow, yeah. Um, we have a question uh, from Facebook. If you could explain the use of cactus juice for restoration. <laughs> Gosh, and I didn't mention that, so somebody's been doing their homework. <laughs> um, it's been long a tradition in um, this area, the, the borderlands area, that when mixing plaster to stop the um, plaster drying so quickly, that they've added um, mucilage that is boiled out of um, the Nepal cactus, which grows wild in many places throughout the state and into uh, sections of the Sonoran Desert. And so as part of the complex mix of plasters that are made for these buildings, 
um, the Nepal juice added is um, an agent that seems to work particularly well as a bonding um, agent that prevents too rapid drying. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. I know uh, right here on campus, we have such a huge collection of um, uh, American indigenous art and artifacts and, and whatnot. So what kind of survive, we have a question about what kind of surviving architecture similar similarly is in the area? To the mission? Yeah. Well, this is described as the finest example of Mexican Baroque uh, architecture in, um, in the US. We do have a sister mission that was part of the Kino chain at Tumacocori, about 50 miles south here, nearer to the Mexican border. But Tumacocori is what's called an active ruin. It's under the uh, care of the National Park Society, uh, National Park Service. So it's a, a very different operation. It's no longer a working church. Um, but its style is uh, technically quite different. It does have a single dome and a bell tower, just a single uh, tower. Um, but the wood used at Tumor Corkery because it was more plentiful along the rivers there. So the, the original roof structure was made out of wood, not um, vaulted brick as you see here at um, San Javier. Um, to answer the question more fully, there's not really sister buildings, but San Javier has kind of created an architectural style that has been copied in many places in Tucson. Um, the old district courthouse in downtown Tucson has many elements that um, really draw from San Javier. Um, the modern cathedral in downtown Tucson also uses many of the elements. In fact, if you looked at it, it's kind of like a modern version of San Javier with twin towers and the big ornate facade in the front. And, there are probably three, four, five other buildings that I can think of that kind of all play or riff off the architectural style. But within the mission complex uh, that, that have become the Kino missions, this particular Baroque um, look is found in only two or three other places. It was really a style that was kind of going out of fashion by the time this uh, building was designed. And the best examples probably occur Sorry, my photographer is having a heat flash. <laughs> We're going to go down. So we were talking about architectural style and I was explaining that um, the missions that probably have the most um, architectural relationship to San Javier would be a, um, a group of missions in the Sierra Gorda, which lies north of Mexico City. Nice. In fact, we're bringing in a conservator from uh, that area to help us with the work that we're doing on our facade that will begin next month. It's amazing how so much can be interconnected over such big pieces of land, you know, and across cool. borders. Um, let's see, we have another question from Facebook. Exterior paint analysis of the missions here in the San Antonio area indicate a very vibrant color scheme, at least before 1820. Is there much evidence of changing exterior paint schemes over time, uh, like on the white dove of the desert or other Santa Cruz missions? Um, as far as San Javier is concerned, we're fairly convinced that the um, stock architecture was the vibrant white that you see. We do believe that the facade was fairly highly colored, that central arch area at the front portal. Uh, and that's one of the things that our investigative team are going to be looking for, particularly when they do their in-depth research next month. 
uh, picking up on um, original pigments of color that they discover underneath the uh, restored layers of plaster. And there's been some um, conjecture already that uh, there was actually sections of the, of the facade that were highly colored. In fact, I've heard it said that maybe if the Franciscans had had access to neon, that they would have used it in the facade because the goal was really to draw people in to experience the beauty of the um, Baroque architecture within the church. That was really supposed to be the draw. But as to the rest of the building, uh, no evidence that there were colors other than the white that you see now. Interesting. Um, okay, we have a question. We have a good swath of questions. Qu this is a quick one. What language are the masses in? Um, they are in English. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a question more about how you guys run things. Do you consider yourselves more museum or more mission? Is there a focus more on tourism or building the community around the mission? Um, and how has COVID impacted all of this? Are you talking about my organization, Patronato, or are you talking about um, the parish? Um, I think the question would, I guess, be about the relationship between both. Um, well, I think that Sanavia has been promoted as an historic site, but it also is an active parish church. I mean, during regular uh, periods of time pre-COVID, during the high season, we would get probably 250,000 visitors a year uh, to the mission complex. Um, and th there was a feeling at that point that in a way the church was being loved to death. We did set up a, a docent program to try and address how we would manage crowds. But, you know, even components of the DOSA program gets very invasive if we're here simply to worship. So I think that's a conversation that's beginning to change, especially given that COVID has really forced us to reassess. Uh, during a period of time when COVID first established itself, the community closed down completely and there was no tourists. And, uh, the church was, to all intents, closed. There's been no services. And while it's opened up for a smaller tourist footprint, really the obligation is to provide a worship space at this point and it's open limited hours nine to two and as you saw when we went into the church there's actually a barrier that prevents people going more than about a third of the way to the church so i think COVID is really forcing us to rethink how we manage uh, an historic site and the interest that that um, promotes uh, versus how do we preserve a worship space for what is an active parish church with strong links into an indigenous community. Right, right. Um, well, I think at this point, I'm gonna pass it back off to Ms. Smuller, but I must say, I expect to see me in person sometime soon. <laughs> Great presentation. We'd welcome you. I was gonna ask if you'd ever been, Ben. <laughs> Not to that one, but like you said, it's very alive in, in Tucson all around. Well, I you. should get into submission shaming here. This is unacceptable, you know, Ben. <laughs> I know he's so close. Uh, Miles, we're wondering, are, do you have any either books or resources you'd recommend for those um, interested in learning more about the natives or about the mission itself? Um, yeah, there's a couple of sources. You could go to our website, patronadosanjavier.org, where we actually have a, a portal for docents, which provides quite a lot of um, literature and links into information about the mission and about that historical period that saw the mission culture grow here. There's also a very fine uh, coffee table book, and I say that um, with true meaning because it weighs about six pounds, uh, called Gift of Angels that was written by the, one of the founders of Patronata. It's a very in-depth look at the spiritual elements within and throughout the church with some stunning photography that would really help um, build out the experience that you had today. Great, thank you. And what, what is something with Petronato and what you do, what is something that you hope people take away when they visit the mission? 
I think that people who visit the mission are actually overwhelmed by the experience that this building could exist, uh, having been created in, in a time when, you know, the first inroads of Europeans into this, this area, that within a hundred years, a building as grand as this could be um, achieved at all. Uh, the fact that it survived through, as I said earlier, one of the most intemperate climates in the world in terms of the vast and extreme changes of climate. Um, but beyond that, it's a spiritual space that just, um, whether you're of the faith or not, just carries with it so much um, power. So I think those three things are what, what I would hope people would take away. And a lot of our students are interested in history, getting into the field. What advice would you give to any students looking to get into, or anyone looking to get into historical preservation? Well, history is more than just about a building or a place. Um, you know, one of the things that I perhaps should have said in answer to the last question is this building came about through um, an extraordinary partnership between cultures, cultures that were quite different. And yet people came together in order to craft something of beauty that has great meaning both then and now. And in a way that tradition lives on, you met our two conservators, one Tahan and one Spanish. So in fact, there's almost a full circle going on in terms of the caretaking that goes on here at the mission. Um, but in terms of the, your second question, the history needs to be understood in a context. Uh, it's ever-changing, the interpretation is ever-changing. For example, we've just redone sections of our museum where we've tried very hard to share information through the perspective of the Tohono O'odham people, not through the perspective that has typically been used where we've interpreted information based upon a sort of an ethno-European-centric vision. And so, you know, I think History is about being open to different perspectives and to really bring that to the study. Thank you. And what, one final question for uh, we leave today. Would you mind sharing some of your personal story of how you got involved um, with the site? Uh, where to begin? <laughs> As a 22 year old student, and you could tell I'm not from these parts, um, I was um, doing a round the world tour on my own from my native land, New Zealand. And when I came to the Southwest, one of the first places I visited with um, friends who live in Phoenix was San Javier. On the day that I was here, uh, as we were coming off the Grotto Hill, which is a, a, a little uh, grotto sanctuary just to the east of the mission, uh, a group of horsemen could be seen approaching down the road. And it turned out that they were reenacting Father Kino's ride and journey to the mission. And so it was just one of those overpowering moments of, um, you know, gosh, imagine being here on this day of all days. And then probably 40 years later, I was looking for a small retirement job, um, having worked for many years as a psychologist but having done a lot of not-for-profit board work, I saw this little part-time job advertised for an executive director of the organization that does the fundraising and management of the projects. And I thought, well, that looks very interesting. In fact, more interesting than anything else I'd seen. So I applied and with a great deal of for good fortune, um, was chosen to be the executive director. And it's really been the job of a lifetime. I've learned a great deal of uh, new information, um, met a lot of wonderful people. And I really feel like it's a cause that resonates because this building has been special to me for 50 years. How was that for an answer? That's wonderful, Miles. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us today. Uh, Kimberly and Tim and Matilda as well. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and showing us a really inside look to this wonderful bit of history that's preserved. Great. It was a pleasure to uh, take you on this tour. 
And thank you all at home for joining us today. And be sure to tune in tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern time as we continue our Hispanic Heritage Month program with a virtual tour of the Tenement Museum in New York. So again, thank you so much and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.